Hello, everybody. I'm going to give a couple minutes for us to join into the call, but I am very excited to have you all join us in. I'm seeing people joining us in now, so going to give a couple minutes for us to log on, and we'll be getting started shortly. As we're waiting here in the chat, I'd love to see all of you who are who are joining in to add in where you're joining us in from. Um, right now, I'm currently in Chicago. Um, here in the Midwest, we are finally seeing the cooler days or the cooler weather coming in. I know that for some time now here in the city, um, it was really, really nice. It felt like we were in the beginning of spring. It felt very confused for a bit, but sure enough, Chicago never fails to let us know, nope, the, the winter is coming really, really quickly. So. Um, but I see here in the chat that we have people from Florida, Miami, Los Angeles. Oh, I am very jealous. <laughs> Boston, New York. Awesome, awesome. So happy to see everybody joining in, in the chat. And as mentioned, we have an amazing event today. I don't want to spoil too much so quickly, but I think we're having we're going to have an amazing conversation related to both uh, National STEM Day, which is today, but also to an honor of all the women in tech who are doing amazing work in the industry, but also the, the rising in the population of Web3. So we have a lot of content to give you all. Hopefully you guys have your pen and paper ready, because for sure we have a lot of content provided for you to take notes of. Um, but we are now at 102, and I don't want to take too much time, but Again, please feel free to continue to add in the chat where you're joining us from. Um, and again, if you have any questions throughout any time of the event, please feel free to ask. We have members of our team here um, in the chat moderating and answering questions. But without further ado, my name is Juana Estrada and I'm a major here at Tenazan Tech. And I welcome you all to today's event in honor of National STEM Day. Um, as the title says here, the future is the future of tech is Latina. Um, and as we know, that is very true. Prior to getting onto the call, we we're discussing kind of just in general how we all know that women are just kind of the leaders behind the scenes, right? We kind of almost run the show, but nobody really wants to give us our titles. But I think in, in this new generation, we know, right? Latinas are the future, right? Um, but with that being said, you know, if you are a Latina or an ally and looking to learn more about Latinas in tech, I highly encourage you guys to go onto our website at latinasec.org. And there you'll be able to become a member of our 22,000 plus network. But outside of that, you actually have access to um, all of our events that we have offered to all of our network and members, um, all of our chapters, and also opportunities to learn more about recruitment opportunities and also professional development programs. We do have one program coming up in the next year for mentorship. So if you're looking to also connect with other women or allies within the network, please feel free. And I highly encourage you guys to go on to our and subscribe. Um, but as mentioned, as part of our membership here at Latinas in Tech, you are a member of our 22,000 plus members of women and allies. Um, and we have chapters all across the country and the globe, including London, Mexico, Brazil, Spain, you name it, right? Um, so again, please feel free to go onto our website and learn more about how to get connected within the cities, within your you, but also to how to become a member and learn more about opportunities offered to you through our network. Um, and also just a quick shout out today we launched our first camp our official campaign for giving Tuesday, um, which will be this year on November 29th. Um, so also I highly encourage you all if you want to be part of this national globe effort um, to go on to our website to learn more about how to donate to leaders in tech. Um, this is an effort to continue to prosper and to grow as an organization to provide you all free access to all of the things we do. Um, so please feel free to go on to website to learn more about that. So. These are my spiels for today. I actually want to give more time to our speakers. Uh, so I really want to offer the floor and also just a quick shout out and thank you to our partners of today, Latinos in Coding and Urbander. These two organizations are amazing. They're leading the way as, if, as far as it goes when it comes to Latinos within Web3. Um, and we have just so much information regarding that. So I want to open up the floor to our two guest speakers. Um, and I'm going to pass the mic to Marcos Navas. Marcos, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Juana, for 
uh, this opportunity to speak with everyone. I'm so excited to be here and uh, talk a little bit about Web 3.0. And I'm just actually going to jump right into it. And uh, we are going to uh, uh, just share my screen one second. I just want to make sure we are good and everyone can see my screen. Are we good? Mm hmm. Perfect. Awesome. So welcome, first and foremost, to the Hands-On Coding Metaverse office at slash campus. This is my metaverse space. Uh, so we're jumping right into Web 3.0, the metaverse being a product of Web 3.0 uh, and becoming more and more inaccessible more in each day. And just to introduce myself, my name is Marcos Navas. I'm the uh, founder and creator of Hands on Coding. I'm a TED Ed innovative educator, also IDEO design think expert, and again, founder and CEO of Hands on Coding. Uh, and we just relaunched our company after the, the pandemic. And with that came Latinos and coding. Uh, and one of the things we are offering is the metaverse platform now. And we teamed up with Urbander to uh, uh, onboard people to that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, but hands-on coding are blocks where we're teaching people how to code with no devices needed. They're blocks that you can put together, put algorithms. Uh, but, uh, and again, that is all a big part of the world of um, 3.0 is this world of computer science, this world of coding. Uh, so we want to just talk about web 3.0. And I just want to actually uh, explain it in one picture. So we are going through a big revolution, uh, the internet revolution, and we went through 1.0, we have web 2.0, and we have web 3.0. And this picture sums it all up. During web 1.0, you had a username and you had a password. Everyone had one. OK, and it was unique in that sense. Uh, then we went into this big movement where social media took over. I remember having my first MySpace account uh, and we moved it to Facebook and to all that. But uh, social media began to dominate and uh, we are now able to use social media to sign into all your accounts, which we sort of are still doing now. Uh, and I'm going to say the pandemic really is bringing us into this new world of Web 3.0, where it's going to be connect your wallet to authenticate in this world. So uh, what are we talking about as far as um, the evolution? We are looking at web 1.0 being very static, you know, um, just websites where you were going to just get information and we moved into the world of apps. And now we're moving into this world of 3D worlds, crypto. We're moving into this world of artificial intelligence, uh, and, and things like that dominating Web 3.0. And to give you an idea of as far as um, as far as a uh, uh, timeline is concerned, um, the first Web 1.0 started in the 90s and went to 2005. And again, basic web pages, basic HTML is all you needed. E-commerce and Java was everything that was running everything. Then we moved into Web 2.0 uh, and we on, on the graph, you see 2006 to present. I'm actually going to put a, a uh, stop to that and say the pandemic was really the end of Web 2.0. When we were all forced into uh, quarantine, you had the push for Web 3.0 to come out of the pandemic. Uh, but during Web 2.0, social media was running. Everything it was all about global Internet access, web apps. Uh, and things like that were moving and dominating. And data monetization was all uh, in. With Web 3.0, we're looking at NFTs. You're looking at somatic web, metaverse, ARs, VRs, the blockchain, uh, AI, and things like that is where we are looking at 3.0. And I know for some people it could be daunting, but it is a transition. Uh, and it's going to be all about... Um, adapting to these transitions. And one thing's for sure is we know that the uh, uh, Latino community is very uh, adaptable. So again, when we're looking at focus, there is a difference from the web 2.0 transition going into the 3.0, um, you know, the different technologies that are running everything and the opportunities in that world. Uh, ownership is a big deal in web 3.0, this idea that uh, we want it owned and we want to make sure it's certified uh, and that's where you see the blockchain doing a lot of, of that uh, side of things. Uh, 3D graphics during 2.0 was a no-no. It was ate up too much memory. And now with the metaverse, that's all we're looking for is 
3D graphics, uh, 3D animations, and, and that world of things is dominating uh, Web 3.0. Uh, the target reach during 2.0 was community, you know, uh, reaching bigger audiences, uh, but not getting too micro. But guess what? With Web 3.0, it's about individual. We're seeing the rise of that with streamers and that world of things and everyone tuning in to individual people now. Instead of going to watch a Netflix movie, they're tuning in uh, to individual people for five, six, eight hours a day just to watch them do things and interact with them. So we're getting more uh, individualized with this world. Uh, the type of applications that we're moving in, AI is dominating things. And I know uh, some of us may have some fears uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence, but guess what? You've been interacting with them for years. Uh, these robocalls, these uh, Google uh, has an amazing little AI bot that just loves to collect your data and then feed you some of those ads, you know, uh, Facebook and things like that. It's all about advertising and behavioral advertising no not so much interactive advertising where hey check this out click here it's more about oh is this what you're interested in here you go let's feed you some of that okay so again the web 3.0 world is definitely moving along and and uh, making things um there is a transition period so we don't need to panic uh so much uh and again just showing you that 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 change from static read-only web pages to information-centric and interactive uh, to now going more user-centric. Decentralized platforms uh, are really taking off right now. We're seeing that even in the metaverse side with decentralized platforms such as the Sandbox and Decentraland really blowing up out there. Um, the platform you see I'm using here is called uh, Frame VR, which is, uh, uh, again, a metaverse platform that we are using at Urbander, again, uh, to help uh, businesses uh, get started. Also, uh, there's a big shift from Web 2.0 in all industries, banking, the way we message people, content. Uh, you're starting to see a shift of how we are moving over, uh, again, that transition and how apps and other tools are coming into play uh, for that transition. Uh, there are three basic pillars when it comes to Web 3.0, the semant I'm sorry, semantic web uh, is a way of just organizing data so that uh, machines can start understanding the way humans uh, uh, do. And that is big uh, and huge important because of artificial intelligence. And the idea of machines learning our, our patterns and behaviors uh, so that it can start uh, um, assisting us uh, a little bit better. Uh, and again, the metaverse is creating a whole market full of opportunities, a whole market full of workplace. Um, there are uh, amazing jobs happening and you don't have to be a coder. You don't have to be in computer science, but uh, storytellers, uh, actors, musicians, there's a place for everyone in Web 3.0. There's a place for everyone in the metaverse. And I am just going to, again, uh, now just walk over and actually this is the beauty of the metaverse. We can just transfer and go to places right away. Uh, so we are in the theater right now and I'm going to hand this over to uh, Sammy. I just want her to uh, introduce herself and then I'll come back and share her portion. Thank you so much, Marcos, and also Latinas in Tech for creating this space to have this meaningful conversation. Um, my name is Sami Jimen Marrero. I'm the founder and president of Urbander, and now a partner and collaborator with uh, Nalas here and uh, uh, hands in coding, hands on coding. And so we're going to present to you now um, some information, right, regarding the why. Why are we doing this? Why this event is so important to share with you, you know, um, where we're going and some basic information, foundational, right, information regarding Web3. And so I launched in... Um, August, a campaign call. Uh, so you only call us in September. And uh, it was really to address 
the issue that I have, right, with Hispanic Heritage Month always being just confined to that one month when we have so many issues that we need to address and find uh, solutions for. And so uh, coincidentally, one of the videos that we published was um, on STEM, right, our, our lack of representation in STEM. And so we want to kick off my portion of the pre presentation sharing uh, this video with you and then a quick presentation regarding our power as a Latino community. Okay, we're gonna just jump into the video. Just wanna make sure everyone can see my screen. Hey, you only call us in September. How about calling us the rest of the year to create a pipeline of Latino professionals in STEM? Latino workers are traditionally recognized for their impact in industries such as agriculture construction, and hospitality. They have also contributed to the United States advancements in technology, from IT and aerospace to e-commerce and healthcare as engineers, scientists, inventors, and innovators. As demand for technology increases, so does the need for professionals in STEM, but only 8% of STEM jobs are held by Latinos, according to Pew Research. In the next decade, Hispanics will account for 78% of net new workers, and we want those higher paying STEM jobs for our kids. Y tú, Latino, despierta. Hispanics are one in every five people in the U.S., so Hispanic heritage is everywhere, every day. It's time to drop the maracas and start talking about equity. This is a wake-up call brought to you by Urban Nerd. Hey. And so... And so it's all about equity, right? Creating equitable access. And these conversations like the one that we're having today are, thank you, Andrea. Uh, these conversations like the ones that we're having today are part of that work, right? And so we're gonna talk to, to today about leveraging the power of Latinas in tech to deliver representation in STEM. Uh, remember, we're only 8%, right, of all STEM professionals, and that needs to change. Um, and we need to um, share with you, right, how we view that the, that collective advocacy is that link, right, or that trigger that can bring forth socioeconomic change. And so let's level set. I know the census numbers just came out, and you're probably familiar with this, okay? But right now, today, 20% of people here in the U.S., right, are Latino, and that reflected a 23% increase in the Latino population from 2010 to 2020. When you compare that with all other ethnic groups combined, they, they it was only 4.3%. So we should have 20%, right, professionals in STEM. And so this is a trend that's um really impacting, right, the shift, the multicultural shift to the new global majority and our road to 2045, which is the tipping point where the majority of people in the U.S. are going to be uh, black or brown. And that trend you see, uh, it, the, the increase was this huge, right, 276% increase of uh, people that identify as multiracial. And that's a jump from 9 million to almost 34 million. Why? Because of love. Latinos love to love on each other and to love on others as well. But it all started in 1967. There was a couple called the Lovings that wanted to get married. Um, and it was against the law for biracial um, couples, right? Or interracial mar marriages to occur. Only 3% um, back then uh, were um, interracial marriages here in the US, but that has changed. They won. Um, their case in the Supreme Court. And after 1967, we're all free to love who we want to love, right? And so um, these are the latest numbers from uh, Pew Research. Today, 17% of um, marriages are interracial. And this is the breakdown as to people from different ethnic groups that marry outside of their current ethnicity and culture. Leading the way, in terms of multiracial marriages is Latinos plus whites, uh, people of um, you know Anglo or only white uh, descent representing 42% of all interracial marriages. So you see, 
how Latinos and Latinas are pretty much uh, birthing the new uh, generation of Americans. And what does that say about our workforce? As you saw in the video, 78% of net new workers are going to be Latino in the next decade, according to the US Department of Labor. So we're on the radar, totally on the radar right now. And it's important for us to understand the economic value that we bring to the table too. If, they, if we took all Latinos, all Latinos in the US and created a separate country and how, how many people wish we could do that, right? But in any event, we would be the fifth largest GDP in the world, okay? Um, I want to tell you that the Latino Donor Collaborative has been doing this research since 2012. Just maybe a month ago, we still were number seven, but they released the new research, the more updated research, and we made it to number five now, right after U.S., China, Japan, and Germany. And imagine where we would be, you know, if we didn't have all of these barriers of access and equitable treatment um, in front of us constantly every day. And so it still impacts, right, our household income. So notwithstanding and despite all of these challenges and barriers, right, um, that we face and that we're making such a low ho household income, you know, compared to other, um, to, to the white only community, to the Asian community, and just in general, across the US, we're below, right? And, and we lost some also um, during the pandemic. Um, we're still making inroads. We could be right after the US, actually, right? As soon as we keep on breaking down these barriers. And so we've seen these changes, right? And the thing is, we're so far behind because with each industrial revolution, we've we've been, you know, uh, marginalized, disenfranchised, underserved, underrepresented, the migration experience also, right? While you get settled in, it takes a minute. And so these are the three prior revolutions that happened, you know, um, 1978 with steam and mechanical production, then mass production of the 1800s, right? Then we go into electronics in the, you know, 1970s around there. And now we're experiencing this new um, revolution. And so we need to be at the forefront of it. We need to get involved, okay? And so, we're going to share a link with you uh, regarding an article from the World Economic Forum talking about the fourth industrial revolution and their concerns, right, as a reputable nonprofit global leader. And these are some three key points that I pulled out of that article. Number one, that we should therefore remember that all industrial revolutions are ultimately driven by the individual and collective choices of people. We decide how we respond to it, right? Like with this whole mess with Twitter, right? We as a people can, can respond to it the way we want to and can control the narrative. Number two, that the fourth industrial revolution may look and feel like a foreign force with the power of a tsunami, but in reality, it's a reflection of our desires and our choices, and I might add, and our values, okay? And then last but not least, and very importantly, at the heart of discussions around emergent technologies is a critical and central question, and I wanna pose it here today in this forum, in this discussion, what do we want these technologies to deliver to us, to Latinos, and to humanity? OK, and so I want to propose, OK, that if we're the matriarchs, right, of the new America, because we're literally birthing the next generation of 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 Americans. I mean, the numbers don't lie. Don't kill the messenger. That's what the U.S. Census says. This is what we'd like to propose. Lean into your power and to your influence. Model behaviors that elevate everyone everywhere you go. Advocate with intention. Exercise peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, lean into each other, pass on our ancestral values, and some of them are ingenuity and problem, problem solving, right? Um, set audacious goals, you know, go big or go home at this point, right? Connect, organize, and mobilize, and this discussion is a very, very great first step, and please, for the love of God, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Once you experience success, don't become a gatekeeper, because that, and that's one of my biggest pet peeves, and so we wanted to bring two different um, examples quickly. 
of what that actually looks like, right? Advocating, mentorship, leaning in, exercising your power. Um, and so it's the collaboration, for example, that Navas and I have. We met, what, two and a half months ago through a mutual friend that said, wait, you guys sound like you talk, you talk e like each other. You need to meet. And what was that for? And since then, we've been working very closely to intentionally find ways to transform the metaverse specifically, right, as part of Web3 into a business asset or a business resource. And we found that we'll share this one pager with you. So many benefits of metaverse marketing, because I'm a marketer, I don't know much about tech, right? But I surround myself now with Navas and his team, you know, to, to be able to infuse tech into what I'm doing. And also, different uh, business applications for the metaverse as well from a branding perspective and an experience perspective. And, and in that process, we're mentoring each other, we're being intentional, we're collaborating, we're sharing resources, we're building trust. Okay, and so that's that's one example. Another way that I invite all of you uh, to also participate in this collective drive, right, to ensure that we have a stance and that we participate and, and elevate our voice, our collective voice, Latinas, right, are the future of tech, okay, is to help change the mindset that we have. Sometimes we're bogged down by tradition or by fear of the unknown. And I think that a very um, good starting point was if we can all, everyone that's on this line right now, right? And this experience um, helps debunk certain myths. And these are five myths that we were able to identify. Number one, you don't need to be Einstein, right? To work in STEM, okay? Because then that would remove like 97% of the population, right? Number two, you can all, another myth, you can only get into STEM with a four-year degree, and that's not true. There are other pathways that create equitable pathways, right? Like um, technical schools, vocational schools, and associates programs, certificate. Hey, I know certificates, right? Um, that you can, after three months, you can be adept in some component of coding, tech, you know, industry to and, and land a, a six-figure income, right? And I, I've, I've heard many of cases uh, uh, as this. Number three, integrating STEM into an existing business is difficult. Hogwash, look at me, right? I had no idea. I'm not the, t I, I, don't, I don't know much about math, science, all of that, right? And here we are, right? Integrating because I met Navas and we figured out how to collaborate together uh, to make something great. Um, number four, you're not too old to start great. You're not too old or or you are too old to start working in STEM. I'm 52. I'm not a spring chicken. And here I am, right? Getting into this space also. And last but not least, another myth that video games are detrimental for child development, okay? Everything in balance, people. Like we don't want to drink too much, right? Like we don't want to anything in excess, right? But video, these kids are native speakers of, of Web3 and uh, STEM. And so to recap, you know, exercise your leadership and influence, create access for yourself, explore, right? And then open doors and, and have others also access opportunities. Advocate by debunking all of these myths and be a steward, right, of new opportunities in your families and in your neighborhoods and in your workplaces. And last but not least, collaborate. We really need to stop working in silos and come together because, again, together we're the fifth largest GDP in the world, and that says a lot, okay? So thank you so much. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about Urbander, you can scan um, the QR code on the screen. And uh, we're, we're here to answer any questions on the other side of this. So excited to listen to our panel. That was amazing. I honestly, I'm so in love with the, the chat right now. Everybody is just cheering everybody on. Um, I think this is exactly what we all needed to hear today on National STEM Day. Just a really reminder, wake up call to realize that we here are the ones leading this effort here in Web3, but also too in all aspects of STEM, right? 
Um, and I'm just super honored today to also open up the floor to two of our guest speakers today as we introduce into the panel of today. Um, I want to open up the floor to Claudia and Yolanda who will be speaking today and um, I also just want to highlight too that it is very important that for all the ones here in the chat to continue to also to spread your information and network. Um, just a really quick highlight. I know right now we're living in some critical times when it comes to um, the national layoffs. And I want to just make sure that we open up this space here for everybody who is open to networking and offering their resources like ourselves here in this network. Continue to spread your information so we can build our network and grow, right? Latinos are a massive number. We can help each other out in any way possible. So let's continue to spread that knowledge and resource. Um, but with that further ado, um, welcome to two of our guest speakers today. Um, I want to open up the floor for you both to give your quick intros, um, just three topics, right? Your name, where you're coming from, or location, and what is your current role? And also just for the heck of it, right? What is your favorite <laughs> meal for Thanksgiving? I know it's right around the corner, so I would love to learn more about that as well. Um, but Claudia, if you don't want in mind taking the lead. Yeah, buenos dias. Thanks everybody for being here. What an inspirational day. Um, it's so rejuvenating to be with such great leaders. Uh, I'm Claudia Mercado. I am in Oakland, California, and I am the founder and CEO of Cali Bueno. We're a, a cannabis company operating out of Oakland since 2018, and we're um, both a delivery service and a brand focused on the Latino market. And my favorite thing to eat, I know this sounds kind of cliche, but my mom makes tamales. She kind of cheats for Thanksgiving. <laughs> so I eat those first and then the turkey. So that's how we do. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, my name is Yolanda Lozano. I am uh, living in, well, I'm in transition right now. I'm doing the remote thing a little bit, but I'm uh, most recently been living in uh, New Mexico, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and I come from actually from high tech. So I was in high tech for 20 years and uh, several startups. And um, I decided uh, the clock was ticking and needed to have kids uh, as I was turning 40. And uh, kind of did a massive shift and started walking by the schools and realizing that they were empty in the computer labs all the time and that there were no resources. So I slowly basically started volunteering and then pulled into started teaching and then writing curriculum. And now um, I founded Computer Science Alliance with a co-teacher of mine. And we basically do advocacy for students and uh, we fundraise to train teachers. So most of what we do is uh, write federal grants and get teacher training, but we also just got an NSF grant that is culturally relevant pedagogy for computer science. So we train teachers on how to adapt their lessons for foreign language speakers, for native students, for students of color, basically. Um, and so I'm pretty passionate about the whole STEM space because I do come from a data science and math background. And then of course I had to program to do all of that. And I got into computer science from that angle, but I worked in the business space and corporate strategy for a long time. Um, but I realized that my pathway was, um, I was lucky. I had a lot of mentors and I had a lot of help, um, right place at the right time until I entered corporate. And then I hit a massive wall of not only were there no women, um, back when I started working in corporate high tech startups, but there were certainly no Latina women in, anywhere in sight. Um, and I did even work in Latin America and all the VPs for all the US companies for Latin America were all, you know, mostly white male. Uh, they weren't even Latinos for the most part back then. <laughs> so at least now I, I see that there are more of those, but you know, I would be on stage with Oracle and Microsoft and Sun Microsystems and DEC, and I'm dating myself, but anyway, a lot of these high tech companies, and uh, and it was amazing. Like, you know, they didn't in Mexico City, huge forum. They didn't speak Spanish, so I actually ended up answering all the questions when I was 29 years old, and they were all like veterans of the space, just because I think there was a lot of curiosity around technology and just the fact that um, there were not that many women, and then they didn't speak Spanish. But anyway. Thank you so much, Alana. I think that highlights a lot of kind of the journey of a lot of women in the space, right? Is that especially the veterans, right? Growing up in the space, it was it was just you and maybe one more person in the other department, right? Um, and then it was just you two figuring out how to create those language barriers and how to like mer merge those communities, right? But I think it's really essential to hear how you both came from different sectors within tech, but also found a need somewhere else and created that space for you to grow and to prosper. And I think it's in alignment to our discussion today, right? How it's like 
you know, there is a space for us Latinas here, Latinos in general, to grow within, whether it be Web3, whether it be in STEM, wherever you are in the industry, right? There's space for you to grow if you find a need. Um, and I wanted to ask you both about that, right? When you guys both entered into tech or into the space of tech, um, what was that like for you both? Um, particularly, what obstacles did you guys have to come across? But also, too, what were some of the moments that you realized, like, you know, I can do this for myself. I don't, I don't have to be into this narrative, right? As Sammy said earlier, right? Um, how were you able to overcome those obstacles, but also what were those learning moments for you to grow? Uh, I can go first. So, you know, I, I graduated from Mills College here in Oakland. It's a woman's, it, it, it was a woman institution and I have a BA in, in master's. So I, I saw somebody say that the arts are important, you know, I think liberal arts are very important because it allows us to bring our culture to Web3, right? Like, Spanish literature is important. The arts are important. It's what defines our culture. Uh, so having come from a liberal arts college, you know, I, I was living in the Bay and I saw that there was an ecosystem forming. So again, like Sami's talking, we have to have the foresight to see what's coming and be, be intentional. Um, so I knew I had to get into the tech world and I made that really my, my goal. And I started networking on LinkedIn in 20, 2007. I, I started going to Silicon Valley for meetings and making connections because I had to find the Latino leaders. You know, Yolanda mentioned she was the first. And I said, you know what, you know what, we're not alone. I know there's people out there. So I was intentional about going out and looking for those people. So I see a lot of people on the chat. Thank you so much for posting your LinkedIn profile. Definitely connect. So I got into tech because somebody referred me to a startup company uh, in 2010. And they said, I met Claudia, she's a rock star. She's a go-getter. She's independent. She's a good thinker. So they recommended me to join the sales team. That was in 10, 2010. But then I soon realized that, you know, Latinos were only 2% of the tech industry. And that became really apparent when you realize your ability for upper mobility is very limited because you don't really resemble the rest of your team. And they don't really understand your values or your work ethic, right? Or the complexity of your life issues. You know, like back then I was paying my mom's rent. So I couldn't quit my job even though I hated it, <laughs> you know? Uh, but I was grinding there every day, 12 hour shifts. Um, so I made that happen. So when I realized that I, like I was, my growth was stunted, I realized that I could start my own company because I saw these companies raise money and then burn tons of money. So that's kind of how Cali Bueno came about. I said, there's a cannabis industry coming. Um, you know, what are going to be the companies that are going to be putting products that are going to be good for our communities, right? That are value aligned. Um, and, you know, we need more business owners. Don't confuse the base, you know, the summit or the, the, the base for the summit, right? Like you have to be an owner. We have to be, ha have a seat at the table. So that was my transition from tech into Cali Bueno, but I took all of those, all of that information to Cali Bueno. So now I have to connect with Sami and Marcos and I have to figure out how to bring Cali Bueno into Web3. So, you know, that's a transition. You, you take everything you have and you just keep building up and, it is very scary. I mean, Yolanda, maybe you can touch on this. You know, there's times where you probably want to give up or you, you feel like you're not being validated, but uh, you just have to persevere because, you know, the art community needs us. And I think anybody on this panel can speak on that and on why we do what we do. And maybe people in the audience who can put your your notes, like what, what makes you keep going and never give up? Absolutely. That tenacity is important when it comes to being in this industry, right? It's in realizing that it's not going to happen overnight. You have to keep going and figure out a way. Yolanda, I would love to hear about your experiences too. You know, I have to say I was I was lucky in that I, I joke around about this. I was very lucky in that I grew up in Section 8 housing, um, <laughs> and super poor and completely clueless about what my options were. And my mom just kept saying, you have to go to college. And I, you know, single mom household, very stereotypical. Um, and I was lucky enough to get in the University of Michigan on a full scholarship. And that definitely, I That's suffered awesome. severely. I came um, with a lot of deficiencies. And, uh, you know, it took me a long time to catch up. And I have to say that I also brought with me a little bit of the Latina partying spirit. Um, mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time uh, dancing and, and drinking there. But, you know, I made a lot of amazing connections in the community as a result, because we did have a group and there was this huge Puerto Rican group that I used to hang out with actually for a long time. And it was, it was wonderful to have that, to have the food and to have all of that stuff that I missed from home. And then um, I ended up working, um, I got a fellowship, uh, I ended up working at Rice University and kind of getting, seeing what it was like to get admitted 
what the college admissions process was like. Um, I was assistant director of admissions at Rice um, in charge of uh, minority recruiting for a year. And I was, I mean, I saw myself in this, through this looking glass and, and realized, wow, I can't believe I actually made it to Michigan and all this stuff, considering my background statistically, you know, it should have never happened. Um, and then I uh, went to Carnegie Mellon for grad school, which put me in a whole different playing field of, you know, a lot of engineers, very highly technical. And I will say that my background in Michigan, I got a Spanish literature degree. So I didn't always <laughs> I did not start in STEM. I started out in engineering, but I, I suffered so much that I ended up getting economics uh, and a uh, Spanish lit degree, basically. And then um, the fellowship was for people who wanted to return to STEM fields. Um, and uh, that exactly fit my profile. And so at Carnegie Mellon, I ended up doing uh, data science and econometrics, but you can't really go to Carnegie Mellon and not learn how to program. It's kind of in the blood there. So I, I got pulled in, I got a master's, and then I went to work for the Federal Reserve. And that was the first place where I realized that I stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, you know, I walked in with a red business suit. That that was my story. Like, and I walked into the cafeteria and I looked around and I I didn't even notice that somebody walked up to me and walked behind me and said, blue or black or gray, that's not the red. You really you're gonna have to lose the red. <laughs> and I was oh like, wow. <laughs> And my 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 uh, my mom had you know spent all this money getting me like suits so I could fit and look perfect, but none of them were blue or or black or gray, and my blouses were all super colorful, and I had all these you know. So anyway, I, I learned to I had to tone it down honestly because I felt like I stuck out so much. So that that was like one of these weird cultural things that I hadn't really realized that I I carried with me. Um, and then, you know, throughout that whole experience, you know, and at Carnegie Mellon, the problem was like my entire second year of my master's, there was not a single woman in any of my classes. Yeah. And um, now as I get involved in the alum committee, I push pretty hard for a lot of that stuff just because, you know, they talk, you know, and all of them talk about how they're trying to increase the numbers. It's just, you know, the students um, aren't applying, you know, a lot of them aren't there. And, you know, and that's where the whole high school involvement for me is like, it needs to start earlier. We need to get the message out really early and make girls feel like they can do this stuff and make Latinos make feel like they belong. And right now they don't feel that way. I think what is so essential to your journey, and I, I love that you were so vulnerable to share this, is the realness of that, right? I think anybody in this chat who particularly comes from Latino descent has had to tone it down in some aspect, right? And that's the unfortunate part about it is that we feel like we stand out, but it's that uniqueness that makes us propel and find those sectors where we're like, wait, I'm standing out because I'm the only one here, right? Um, which I think is really awesome too, in a sense, but it takes some time to develop. And I really want to ask you both about kind of that experience because you don't, you both mentioned this as part of your journey um, as part of like finding those mentors, or those connections um, and either part of your, of, of your journeys. Um, what was it like to find somebody within your network that was, that you felt resonated with you and your story, but also you felt empowered enough to be like, I would love for you to mentor me or even sponsor me in my career. Right. Um, Yolanda, would you like to share? Yeah, I will say that um, there was one person at the last startup, which is now Citrix Systems. It's a massive corporation. It's not, you know, um, who was there for a very short period of time. And I've never forgotten her because um, it was in South Florida. We, you know, I was living in, in South Florida at the time. And uh, we informally, I would just go into her office and talk to her about certain things. And it was, she was very careful and very concerned about perception that we were talking about things and she would make sure she closed her door and she would, you know, give me some advice about, um, just generally how to deal with something. And she had a pretty extensive background, but she actually ended up leaving. She decided that the pressures and the lack of feeling like she fit in um, were just too big and she decided to go somewhere else after she had been a C-level person even. And so it was pretty amazing to me and, and slightly discouraging, but then she decided to start her own um, consulting firm. Uh, and I feel like I understand now better why she did that. But oddly enough, one of my most influential mentors is um, 
he's a high school teacher who just retired. Um, you know, he is a, he's a, he's also a board member on the computer science teachers association. Um, he's from California and he does consulting with the, you know, the California schools around curriculum and Latinos and, 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 uh, Art Lopez is, it's this, you know, he's this, um, kind of so accepting, so open and so encouraging a person is not, you know, and I guess that's what makes him an awesome teacher, but it's like, but it took me forever to find him. I mean, it wasn't something, somebody I found early days. And, 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 you know, I, I always say my biggest, you know, somebody, some, oh, your superpower is that you can kind of blend in into any crowd. And I was like, but you understand that the assumption when people look at me is that I am not necessarily, people will start, you know, making disparaging remarks about Latinos in front of me without realizing mm -hmm. until they see my name. <laughs> um, because I don't look it, I can hide in plain sight, but you know, it's a, it's a, a double-edged sword. Absolutely. That is, that is so real and true. It's like, you, you want to find people who you can lean on, but at the same time too, it's like, once you blend in, it's like, you blend into the whole mush of it all, right? Um, Claudia, how about your experience with mentorship or just finding people in your network that supported you as you move into kind of the space of cannabis too, as well, right? Uh, well, there's been so many people in my life, and I think that's the great story of this country, you know, and kind of where we're heading. <clears throat> we're never going to be short of mentors or people that we look up to, and I think we just have to recognize that within our community. There's so many great stories out there. Uh, we just have to find the time to tell each other the stories because we're not alone. <clears throat> so, you know, after college, I did find Teresa Alvarado. She's now the VP of pg and &E, um, through Nashimba, the National Society of Hispanic MBA. So again, I, I went out and looked for that network to really bring me in. Uh, but what I found in Teresa was, the, was this woman leader from San Jose, you know, her family has deep roots in San Jose, multi-generational. So she is Californiana. So that also aspect of the Latina, of like people who have lived in this country who have Latino roots. And, you know, her family was really deep in politics. So I started to understand also the importance of our voice politically. And I think that's also important, you know, today is a primary. So go out and vote everybody. Yes. Um, so yeah, so she, you know, so she was a mentor in that sense, you know, I think we can, we can come to the table with, with all of our belongings. Um, and she showed me that, you know, she was a leader in her community politically. She was sitting on um, different boards. That's the first time I learned about sitting on boards, which is another aspect of Latinos. You know, we need to take a seat at the table, especially now I know we're talking about STEM, but, you know, I think um, people try to put us into categories. And like we mentioned earlier, STEM also relies on the liberal arts for it to work right? Like we need creatives, we need artists. Um, so, you know, having seen her sitting on boards and being a leader and representing, that also motivated me to sit on a board. So for the last 10 years, I've been a public board member on the Osteopathic Medical Board of California. Um, and I have been able to actually pass legislation where DOs can now prescribe or recommend cannabis. So, you know, that was almost 15 years ago or 20 years ago when I first met her and I started kind of diving of like, who is Teresa? What is she up to? I want to be like her. And now, you know, I'm like, I'm Claudia and I'm sure people look at me like, I want to be like Claudia. And I think that's, that's what, that's the biggest win. And, you know, going back to Sammy's numbers, the future relies on our, the future is now. So find those mentors, find those leaders that you guys look up to and let, let's keep building together. Very beautifully said. That actually gave me chills. That's awesome. That's really, really awesome from both of you to share. And even in the chat, we have a lot of love being shared here. Um, and I want to quickly interject because I know we have some time left for Q&A and I want to make sure everybody who has questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A box and I'm going to be delegating those questions through there. Um, but just the last question before we wrap up our panel questions too. Um, I just, I know that we talked a lot about kind of the, the relevance of kind of women Latinas within this force, right? And the influence that we have when it comes to emers, when it comes to Web3 in all aspects, right? But I think in general, what do you think is needed from us Latinas, right? What is it that, we, that you feel can really be like that, that last note that will allow us to elevate to the next step, right? Whether it be working on our, you know, our, our mindset of narratives, right? Or working on our careers. Like, what do you think is what's gonna propel us to get to that next level within our industries? I know it's a lot of question, but I think you guys both have. Yeah, yeah. just, yeah. just I, I, you know, I, I like to be really optimistic about the future, but I think in order for us to really even have a planet earth, <laughs> you know, we Latinas need to, I think need to be the force that creates a sense of urgency because you know, we've always been fighting for the future of our families and the time to fight for that future is now. 
And I think, you know, we can make that change through, you know, Web3 and STEMs, but we have to be intentional. Um, so that's, I just needed to get that off. <laughs> yeah, thank you for saying that. Absolutely. Yolanda? Yeah, no, you know, it's funny because, I mean, there's no silver bullet, you know, there, there's not one answer. I think earlier, Sammy made some some comment during her presentation about supporting other women. I mean, sometimes you have to be proactive because um, not doing anything is kind of being negative, you know, it's so I think just being proactive, if you see, I, I tend to be a little bit out there sometimes and I'll see a young woman who is doing something really interesting and I'll just walk up and say, you know, here's my number, call me. And I've had some pretty amazing, you know, experiences and I've learned so much through those interactions. Um, but I wish somebody had walked up to me because I think when you're younger, you feel intimidated by those women. So like Claudia's talking about being a leader and, and, and I'm positive there are women who would love to have her as a mentor, but they're not going to approach her because she seems like this, oh my gosh, look at her resume and all the stuff she's done. Um, and so sometimes you have to flip that a little bit and, you know, um, go after, I mean, I know time constraints are always real, but, and then the other thing is like doing something on a more organized um, scale, I, I, you know, I've, I've been trying to think of the most, the things that changed my life and the pivot points that I had. And one of them was this fellowship program um, that I was, I was part of the Woodrow Wilson Foundation Fellowship Program, um, which was all minority students. We got pulled in for six weeks to do um, academics, public speaking, math, you know, all this stuff together. And um, we ended up doing a lot of uh, of discussions and you know we were staying at the dorms together so at night we would sit around in the hall and talk or play cards and um that network of people for me has been unbelievable and creating those networks um is amazing and the other place i experienced that was since i graduated the first startup i went to was a harvard business school startup and um the brother, one of the brothers was at Harvard, the other brother was at Carnegie Mellon with me. And what I learned from that experience was uh, Harvard is not about knowledge. Harvard is about networking. They don't know anymore. And in fact, he relied on us. We actually understood things way better than some of the Harvard crowd did. It, you know, at, at certain tiers and, you know, wherever you are, you are capable. It doesn't matter what the school label is. You can't second get your, guess yourself but you can't pay for that networking stuff. You just have to do it. And it's a lot of legwork and it's a lot of coordination and it's not for everybody. But if we can create these networks of support and job exchange and information exchange, then it's amazing what we can do in the long run. Yeah, Absolutely. and don't be, uh, you know, don't, I think failure and fear of failure, right? Um, I can tell you in the last five years building my company, I failed a lot and failures cost you a lot of money especially when you're bootstrapping and I feel like it's like exponential failures but uh just perseverance I think you know the the web3 and, and like what Marcos was talking about um you know don't be scared of diving in and learning and sharing your knowledge or if you don't know um how to get in the industry you know ask for help and then that way you know you can help others so that there's the number we're too big to fail right and um, I think on, on a good way, not on corporate way. <laughs> I think the Latino community, we're too strong in our, in our values um, to fail. So I, I, I'm optimistic that we will thrive, but we have to build communities that are value aligned and really represent us. That is that right there, value line. I think it's super crucial, right? Is that we have the, we have the numbers, but it's also to be intentional about how we go about this, right? Let's get a little uh, strategy behind it all, right? Um, but thank you so much for both of you for taking the time out today to speak on this panel. And I want to jump into the Q&A. I know we have about seven minutes left, so I want to answer some of the questions that we have here before we wrap up. But I did see some questions related to um, mentorship and sponsorship, which I think is in alignment to the question we just had. But um, any of you have any had experience with a sponsor or a mentor that would like to talk about this experience? Or had somebody who invested in you guys, right, um, either vouch for you and your career paths or provided some sort of like stipend to support your, your career paths. I think that's also very valuable when it comes to creating your businesses and going a different route, right? Having somebody say like, I'm going to invest in what, you, what you're what you doing because they believe in you in that monetary sense. Oh, well, I mean, like, you know, like just going back to how we connected, I think Sammy and Marcos met a few months ago and, you know, me and Sammy met a few months ago. And um, I think when, when the opportunity knocks, you know, you have to open the door and, and be willing to make the time and effort 
And, you know, we're not, none of us are too busy to help another person. I think we need to be more kind. Humanity needs us to be more kind with each other. And Latinos, I think that's part of our values and that's part of our blood. You know, we, we like to take care of others. And I think that's, that's what you find in a good mentor. You know, they're willing to just go the extra mile uh, to support you regardless of the time or effort it takes to, to really see you succeed. I'm not sure that answered your question, but. Oh, it does, it does. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about, I mean, I don't think for me, it's been more not maybe monetary support, but more like you can live with me while you're doing this crazy stuff. Or, mm -hmm. you know, there, there were a lot of things like that, that were in kind support or just, um, or even advice, you know, somebody who uh, accounting was always one of these spaces that I've just, it's been a pain and a thorn in my side. And now I'm, a, I, I'm running all the finances for all of the grants and stuff. I, I couldn't have gotten to that point without people volunteering to help me. Um, I mean, I took a class, but it, it just wasn't the same as having somebody to ask. And, and I'll say like national level organizations, like nonprofit groups that I've gone into and just looked at women's forums and just put stuff in chats. You know, uh, I've ended up finding, you know, somebody there who was willing to answer my questions and get on a Zoom with me and, you know, have me open my website and say, okay, this is working or this is not working. So in terms of marketing, you know, things that I didn't necessarily have a whole lot of skill set around, um, I, you know, I've tried to leverage other people's advice and it's been pretty helpful. Absolutely. I'm going to use my little plugin, but Latinas and Tech mm -hmm. is that org for you guys. If anybody here in the chat, utilize this space. And like I mentioned too, we're living in a very hard time right now when it comes to our, our industry. So women and on the call and even allies, I think it's, somebody mentioned a comment here and I think, we, all of us here in this call right now can mention that we've had at least one male counterpart that supported us through the way, right? Whether it be a mentor or somebody who said, hey, you know what, I want to invest in what you're doing. So definitely use this space and network through that as well. It's it's free, it's open, and it's safe, right? Um, I did see somebody here ask in the chat, and I really like this question. It was in regards to um, what do you, what has you, have you, what have you seen in your industry that you've noticed has been the stable, consistent key, right? Um, that hasn't evolved or changed throughout, you know, the evolutions or whatever part of your journey you were in, like, what can you say has remained consistent throughout your journey, your careers? At least that you've noticed has stayed consistent. You know, I would say um, you have to be flexible, a willingness to learn, to be scrappy and take risks. You know, there are just certain things that in order to do things that, um, and to be an entrepreneur or to, um, to advance, uh, you just, you can't let yourself get stale. I mean, no matter what you have to, you know, I'm constantly reinventing myself and whether I'm learning a new programming language or learning a new business skills, I'm, or just meeting new people and learning about new organizations. I just think you have to look at it from the, I like to learn perspective and constantly reinvent yourself. Yeah, and, and don't accept the way the industries begin to shape themselves. You know, we've seen that in tech, you know, um, the fact that we're only 2% in tech and the majority of the founders are white men. Um, let's change that, you know, in, in cannabis, I'm one of the few Latinas in the industry and there's this conception or idea that the, the cannabis is only for 25 year old white males. And my, my take on that is that's not true. You know, cannabis is medicine and our Latino community needs to have access to cannabis because we are the working force of America and we should be able to wake up and feel good, right? And be able to medicate. So, you know, you can bring your own perspective. I see cannabis as medicine. A lot of people in the industry, industry see it as a get rich scheme and, you know, uh, recreational. So just bring your twist to the table in any industry you're in and, um, just, you know, be bold and innovate. And um, yeah, join the Web3, join Latinas in Tech, get yourself involved. And if you don't see something you like, then create it yourself. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And I also want to highlight too, I know, Shirley, you're in the chat and I, I want to highlight too that it is so important too to be inclusive with how we're wording this too as well. I think that is so true. Apologies to that. I, I want to make sure that I am inclusive in all the way of what I'm saying, but also too, it's also important to our narratives, right? I think this is not limited to Latinas, but also to, to all genders here, right? No matter what you identify with, I think what is important to acknowledge is that this space is open to all of us here. So definitely, uh, yes, important to, to remain mm -hmm. open in, in that sense as well. 
I, I really would love for all of us here in the chat to continue to share our information. Um, but I also want to just thank you guys again for being part of um, thank you both for being part of this conversation today. I know that um, this is this is kind of like one of those situations where it, you don't really know who you're going to be seeing or who you're going to connect with. But the openness you guys both were able to do was is super uh, gratification. So thank you so much for that. And I want to also bring back Michaels and Sammy to to the platform. Yes. Thank you so much to Marcos and Sammy for being part of today's conversation. Thank, Thank you so you much. For Thank us. you. Any final remarks from any both and from any of you both? Go vote. Haven't <laughs> <laughs> yet. It's very important, you know. And we're we're one in five people in this country. Imagine if we would all, you know, uh, exercise our vote. And so we, it's it's critical at this point. Absolutely. Go vote, right? Absolutely. As mentioned today, this is a power that we have for the future to come. So utilize today as a, as a way to, to make sure that your voice is heard. But most importantly, too, happy National STEM Day to all the beautiful women and allies here in the call who have made this journey for all of us to make it possible to be seen and represented here today. Um, well, with that, I will give you all back your time and your evening. Thank you for joining us and I hope to see you all on the next call. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Gracias.